This video is a sequel to my last video in which I explained why I'm ditching ND graduated filters. I think it's fair to say since I released that video I've been inundated with requests to explain my exposure blending process in a bit more detail. So I thought I'd put this follow up video together to hopefully show you just how simple and easy exposure blending truly is. I am no post processing expert so if I can do it so can you. In this video I will be predominantly using Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop to do my processing and generally I'm going to try and keep things relatively snappy and quick throughout so this doesn't turn into some three hour epic. No one wants that. I will cover a range of different techniques through this video, first starting with the easiest through to the more challenging ones nearer the end. The goal remains exactly the same though for all of these methods, to create the best overall exposure from challenging high dynamic range scenarios. The starting point will be exactly the same, straight from camera, unedited, bracketed, raw images with no graduated filters used at all. Let's start with the easiest method of all, HDR Photo Merge. Now HDR has a bit of a bad reputation, mainly due to the retina destroying results it can actually create, and I think it's almost a rite of passage for all photographers to go through their terrible HDR phase. Mine was about 10 years ago with these vomit inducing results you can see on screen now. Ooh. However, software has improved massively since then and Lightroom now does a particularly good job I find. The key with HDR is not to post process it too aggressively and when it starts looking a little bit willy wonka, that's the time to apply the brakes and start over again. Here is my base exposure which is exposed for the foreground and here is a secondary bracketed exposure which is exposed for the clouds there. And you can see in each case the images have clipped quite heavily. You can see there on the shadows as well. So really what we're trying to do here is to mould both of them together. So if we select both of these images, right click go up to photo merge and HDR and that will open a little dialog box here. The key thing here is to make sure the auto align is always ticked on in pretty much all cases. You don't want to select any de ghost amount and you can just go and click merge. Lightroom essentially takes your dynamic range from your two bracketed images and sort of welds that together in one single exposure which you can then proceed to edit as you usually would. And essentially what it's doing is it's pulling in the best highlights and the best shadows and hopefully doing away with much of the clipping that you found in the respective files. The initial image can often look very flat as you can see here but if we start to do some edits here on the right hand panel such as bringing the highlights down here you can see that very quickly the sky there has just come alive and vice versa if we just lift the shadows you can see that the foreground takes on new life as well. This approach is incredibly quick and easy. It probably adds, what, 30 seconds to your post-processing workflow. Absolutely nothing. And it actually produces surprisingly good results a lot of the time, provided you competently edit that HDR output file. Um, but there are a lot of downsides as well. It uh, doesn't particularly cope with movement through the scene very well at all, creating ghosting artifacts between your exposures, even with the de-ghosting options enabled in the HDR merge. Um, also, the HDR output files can sometimes be a bit hit and miss. Most of the time it gets it right, but sometimes it gets it quite wrong and it can create ugly looking files. Also, you're giving away a lot of that control and that blending process to Lightroom. You're letting it make the decisions for you, so you don't have very much creative control in the process um, at all. And then finally, you tend to have to push the editing quite hard um, 
really kind of reining the highlights in or drawing the shadows to try and bring that very flat looking HDR file to life which means you're treading a fine line between a nice um, final image that looks well processed and one that looks utterly horrific. <laughs> the next method is mask blending. Now for this I will use exactly the same two exposures as previously used and usually with this approach I would edit both of my bracketed images, I would edit here in Lightroom the raw files and try and get them as good as I can prior to do the merge but for simplicity reasons I'm just going to stick with the straight out of camera files here. So we just select both of the images here, right click edit in and then we open as layers in Photoshop. After a few moments it should load them in a nice stack ready to edit. If we select both images and we go up to edit auto align layers this is a key step in order to get a seamless blend. Now usually I like to put my base exposure which is usually the foreground down at the bottom in terms of layer order but this is just personal preference. If we select the darker exposure for the sky hold alt on windows and click the add layer mask button at the bottom of the panel there it will create a layer mask with everything automatically hidden. The key thing to remember with masking is that black hides, white reveals and grey does something in between. Now what we're looking to do next is to reveal the sky portion of this darker exposure. When you're editing an image that's got a relatively flat and featureless horizon like this, it's really easy to do the blend. Just make sure that white is selected as your colour because we want to be revealing things on the mask. And you can go up to your gradient tool here on the left hand side and you can essentially create your own ND grad filters. Um, a long gradient line like this will replicate a soft edge ND grad like that and a short line just like this will be more like a hard edge ND grad. So you can see the soft edge definitely looks a lot better. Generally it takes a little bit of trial and error to get it right but you have full control over this process. A better approach than using gradients which frankly have a lot of the failings of ND grad filters which I covered on last week's video which I'll just link to at the top now, I'm not going to repeat those. Um, but a better approach is to use the brush tool. So if we just get rid of this gradient here, select the brush tool, the paint brush tool here and make sure that white is still selected because we want to reveal. If we go up to our brush options here, make sure that hardness is set to zero because that feathers the edge of the brush to make sure that we have nice transitions in our painting and also we want to make sure that we have a fairly decent size for our brush diameter otherwise we're going to be here for some time to do the next bit but essentially what we can do here is we can paint in the sky from our darker exposure and it gives us a tremendous amount of finesse and control over this process and what we can actually do next is we can drop the opacity in our paint so that as we get to this transition zone here we can just soften that approach and we can take that all the way down the image to give a real nice seamless transition from dark to light. Now obviously if I spent more than five seconds doing that blend I'd probably do a much better job. This is a little bit ragged around the edges but I just hope it shows you how quick and easy this blending process actually is and this approach is actually really really powerful. If you spend a bit of time on this you can get fantastic blends out of using this approach. A key thing to keep in mind though is that if your bracketed images are too far apart in terms of their exposure level then you can have quite a difficult job trying to seamlessly blend those together. So sometimes it can be a good idea in your raw editing before you try to do the blending just to try and bring those exposures a little bit closer together. It will make your life so much easier at this stage. 
Because you're manually controlling the blending process, you can actually process your raw bracketed images completely differently to each other. So you can approach your sky image and your foreground image differently to bring out the best in those respective parts of the scene. It's a tremendously powerful technique this, and you can actually use exactly the same methodology when you haven't bracketed at all with a single exposure. If we look at this image here, we can see that my camera has actually done a pretty good job of capturing the dynamic range in the scene. We've got a little bit of clipping in the highlights just around the sun there, and a little bit of clipping down in the shadows, but nothing too serious whatsoever. Now in here, we could use the graduated filter in Lightroom, the radial filter, or the adjustment brush to make targeted um, edits within this one single exposure. But alternatively, Alternatively, what we can do is if we right click on this image and create a virtual copy, which I've already done, it creates a duplicate of that file and then essentially you can edit both of those files completely differently. So you can see one here is edited for the sky and the backdrop and one for the actual foreground. And then if we select both images, right click, edit in, open as layers in Photoshop, then essentially we can replicate the same blending process without having any bracketed images at all. This double processing approach is really powerful and I tend to find it gives more control than can be found in Lightroom standard graduated filter or adjustment brush tools, for example. So it's well worth keeping in mind. So, so far I've looked at HDR and mask blending in Photoshop and both of these approaches are really good and should actually cover the majority of photographers needs. However, there are some circumstances where the simplistic masking that I've gone through so far just is not up to it and it will not produce convincing results. Luminosity masking. This essentially takes the same core concept of Photoshop masking to an entirely new level, giving you a greater degree of control and precision over the final results. I'm not going to lie, it's not particularly easy when you first start doing it. Um, and I'm no expert in luminosity masking, can't even say it. <laughs> but honestly, they're not actually as scary as some people make out, particularly if you just stick to the basics. Essentially all it's doing is it's using the same black hide white reveal methodology and masking But instead of using your paintbrush mouse movements to make the selections It's using the brightness levels in pixels throughout your scene to make the masking selections I'll show you what I mean for luminosity masking, I use a third-party plugin called Raya Pro, which is developed by the brilliant Jimmy McIntyre. I'll link to that below. His videos are well worth checking out if you're interested in learning the technique to a greater level than I am able to help you with. He is fantastic. Um, there's lots of other alternatives out there as well. There's Lumenzia from Greg Benz that's also really, really fantastic. Um, but I'm not going to go into detail on those. Um, you can also create the, the masking um, without the plugins. You can do it directly in Photoshop as well. You'll just have to do some searching of your own to find tutorials to help you with that. Um, but essentially you can see here that I've got the plugin um, extension out here on the right hand side and it looks a little bit like the dashboard you might find on a, a NASA rocket or something. It looks very very intimidating when you first see it but trust me it's not actually as bad as it looks. I could probably do an entire video on the topic of luminosity masking, um, so I'm only going to really cover the very, very basics here. So you can see I've got this lighthouse image here, which potentially is a problem for the method that I used before with my masking, simply because of the actual lighthouse itself breaking through that horizon line, and it potentially makes it quite difficult to paint around that without getting some really ugly looking haloing effects around the actual building itself. So if we select both of our images, and if we go to auto align as before, just to make sure that the, uh, the blending process works nice and seamlessly, if we select a darker image here, and if I just go up to my plugin here, 
we create a luminosity mask for the, the bright part of my dark exposure here. So what we're interested in is the sun here and these clouds around here. That is the part of the image I'm interested in. So we create that mask. You can see that it very quickly creates a highly complex mask here. And remember, white reveals, black hides, gray does something in between. The mask that's been created here is perfectly mapped to the image to a very high degree of detail. Try doing that by hand. Um, the next part is pretty cool. If you select white here, so we're selecting the white within that mask, and then as before, selecting the paintbrush tool with a similar sort of settings with white paint, we can essentially painting the sky from our darker exposure into the image. But the key difference here is that the luminosity mask is acting like a highly detailed stencil which only allows the white revealing paint to be applied to particular parts of the image and in particular concentrations as well. So you get very natural looking results here and I can paint back over this to darken down those effects even more. And basically this gives you a tremendous amount of control and finesse in your blends. Um, almost near perfect transitions through your exposures and importantly it doesn't destroy parts of the image where you don't want to apply your effects to such as the lighthouse there so it's uh, it's very very powerful indeed and in my experience it tends to blow ND graduated filters out of the water in virtually every circumstance. Yes, the process can be really daunting and quite difficult when you first dabble in it. And it can take a long time to find your feet and you'll probably create a lot of ugly looking blends while you do so. But with a little bit of practice, you'll get the hang of it and you can actually create quite effective blends in next to no time. I mean, this blend here, what took less than a minute or around a minute, and it's not perfect, I hurried through it, but it's not bad at all. There's a little bit of ghosting up on that cloud there as the, the cloud has moved between the different exposures, but that's easy enough to fix. But yeah, overall, I'm pretty happy with the results from that. As you can see from the methods that I've outlined, exposure blending isn't really that scary. Well, luminosity masking is maybe still a little bit scary and I still get intimidated by it to some extent, but the basics of it are pretty straightforward and all the methods that I've outlined are relatively quick and importantly, they'll generally, as long as they're competently used, will produce superior results to using ND grad filters in most circumstances and they really will elevate your game when you're shooting in high dynamic range situations. Now obviously what I've covered in today's video is just the very tip of the iceberg, it's just the basics. There's so much scope in this area to just make videos all day long on it, but I'm not going to do that. I just wanted to outline the basics for you and hopefully you can run forward with that if you're interested. Um, and obviously also the, the methodologies that I've used are just the approaches that I have found useful, but it's not an exhaustive list. There's going to be lots of other equally valid, if not more valid, approaches out there that other people use. So um, yeah, it's really a, an interesting area to explore in more detail and hopefully I've planted a few little seeds in some minds out there that you can kind of run with. But that brings today's video to a close. If you've got any thoughts on the approaches that I used, so Lightroom HDR, luminosity masking, and the, the manual painting masking, um, pop your comments down below. If you've got any of your other approaches um, that you think are as good as these approaches or better, let me know below and I'd be interested to explore those as well because I'm learning just as much as you guys are. I'm no expert in this area. I, I'm somewhat down the path but i've got a long way to go yet as well so yeah i'd be really interested to hear what you've got to say in this area and um yeah that's about it for today so um thanks very much for joining me on uh, 
today's little post-processing indoor video. It's, uh, it's raining today, so yeah, I thought it was a good day to do it. And um, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, you know what to do. I'll see you all soon. Take care.